Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. It is me, as always, Steve Hall. And today I'm interviewing Jacob Templar once again. And we're talking quite in depth about what his recent transition has been like going from purely focused on powerlifting to incorporating some powerlifting within his own training and bodybuilding and his experiments with really pushing volume. And a quote that we discussed that he had a Instagram post on was, we likely vastly underestimate what we can actually recover from. And this is in reference to quite an extreme study where they were doing BFR on various people and how they were actually able to really adapt to this kind of crazy style of training. And obviously within our space, volume is a key determinant of how much hypertrophy you're gonna get, but quite often recovery is the limiting factor. And then also how much can we actually recover from? We see some wild studies where there was recently one of 52 sets of quads in one week. So we kind of talk about that and how has he applied some of this to his own training where he's getting up to 20, 30 plus sets for some of his body parts. Also talking about how he hasn't really needed to deload in quite a long period of time, how he's managing to do that whilst obviously still pushing very, very hard. We also talk about some misconceptions about the human body, whether or not there's actually wear and tear or is it more like wear and repair and how we can kind of navigate injuries and techniques that maybe people think are injurious, but might not necessarily be for us finishing with kind of the myth or is it a myth that lifting weights is going to stunt your growth as a child. So a really, really interesting chat. I think you guys are going to take a lot away from this. And as a reminder, guys, we really, really need you to subscribe to the podcast. We have quite a lot of people listening over on YouTube. If you're on YouTube now, you may very well be listening and not subscribed. So please subscribe. Same on Spotify, though, or any podcast platform that you're on. Please do subscribe. It really helps the podcast grow. We can prioritize it more, put more, invest more time into it, and also get potentially even greater and bigger guests, although they're already fantastic, of course. But we appreciate all of that help. Please do comment, do share it over on social media with anyone you think would like it. Give us a review if you can. It's all appreciated, guys. But without further ado, let's get into the chat. Hi guys, welcome back to the Improvement Season podcast. It is me, Steve Hall, and on the other end is Jacob Templer. Uh, it's actually been a while since we talked, Jacob. I don't know if you remember, but it was a year yeah. ago. You were busting some myths and misconceptions surrounding kind of locking out your knees on a leg press. So if people are hearing that for the first time and like, oh, should I not? Should I be doing that or should I not? They can refer back to that podcast. Uh, lower back rounding, things like this. And I think we're going to be doing a bit, a bit more of that today as well. But yeah, I can't believe a year had passed because... Yeah, we communicate fairly frequently kind of across Instagram and stuff, but time just flies, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's been, um, thanks for having me on though. This is like, I've been on here probably more than any other podcast I've been on. Oh, damn. Yeah, we got to cross pollinate a little bit more. We, we get more Jacob on here and then people will start hearing and seeing you and be like, yeah, go bring him on. So uh, yeah, I, I'm surprised at on. that. Yeah, you're. A, yeah. I think you're a very well-spoken individual, very well educated, especially within like physio space. But you mm -hmm. lift hard too, which is nice. Um, very much similar to Mike Chalice, who's like our revived stronger physio. Yeah. So yeah, I think you're a great person to talk to about many of these different things. And actually, something I wanted to speak to you about is your kind of transition in training recently, where mm -hmm. you had a heavy powerlifting focus from what I know, and now you've transitioned more towards bodybuilding. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what your experience has been like there, what your approach has been, any kind of lessons that you took from doing that? Yeah, so a lot of it had to do with like, um, just coming onto ATP. So like, there's always areas like my goals primarily have been like, I'm not really looking to compete anytime soon. Like, I just don't have that kind of drive, like my drive is elsewhere. And like, education and things like that. So like, maybe sometime in the future, I might like more probably I would probably be more interested in doing a bodybuilding show than a powerlifting competition. Um, but um, still, like, my goals have always been, like, get as big and as strong as possible. Um, so uh, I still squat, bench, and deadlift like a powerlifter. My programming really looks like just a bodybuilder who likes to do squat, bench, and deadlift. Um, but... Um, once I came on, I was like, Hey, I have these lagging points. Can you guys kind of help me? Uh, what are areas where you might say I should dedicate more volume or change my programming? Cause I, I program for myself, which I've really cracked the code the last few years, um, uh, personally and being able to try things also then feel more comfortable doing them with clients. Um, 
and I noticed that like certain things um, are are like trends for me. So like on lower body, definitely don't need as much volume and um, at least with like squat and deadlift can't recover from as much, uh, especially when I'm trying to push intensity and focus on strength. Um, but then with upper body, like the amount of volume I can tolerate and recover from and actually seem to do well with is much higher than I think most people would would think that you would do or might be able to do fairly frequently. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I guess actually uh, that I took some inspiration from Dr. Pack's work on the kind of minimum effective volume mm-hmm. needed to develop strength, which is like not very much at all. I was like, hey, actually you can do very little. And then I guess uh, Zach Robinson's meta regression talking about kind of proximity to failure. And it's like, hey, you can actually train quite far away from failure. So not fati- as fatiguing when you're training really heavy. So you yeah. might even get some Bennett like power building, which maybe I've taught poorly of in the past actually could be a fruitful path for i'm not saying it's maybe the best but i can definitely see that it it isn't as fundamentally kind of uh tangential to bodybuilding as maybe some people thought so it's cool Mm -hmm. that you're keeping those lifts in there out of interest when you say kind of lower volume and kind of higher do you have like rough set numbers that maybe you can give the listeners so for squat and deadlift i do um, about six sets a week um, but my intensities are usually higher. So not like super, super high. Like I find that for me, like the sweet spot has been um, like a six four two DOP split, um, which for my squat and um, deadlift to not get bottlenecked, I'm doing like sixes and twos. Um, so I'll do like 80 to 85% for like six or no opposite. Sorry. 75% for sixes and then like 80, 85% for twos. Um, and then I've actually this year also slowed my progression because last year before my son was born, um, I was actually probably the strongest I'd ever been. Uh, but I found that like really aggressively pushing the progress there. Like, yeah, I got really strong. But then obviously as soon as he's born, sleep stuff changes, all that. Um, it's just much easier to get kind of burned and then fizzle out versus this year I've been focused on like getting acclimated to those heavier loads and being be like consistently able to tolerate them like irregardless of other factors and things like that um which is leveled off the peaks and valleys I've noticed in my training where like one day I might go in and like you know hit like an all-time PR on a double and the next week have to decrease it by like 40 pounds yeah that's quite a big differential is your so for your strength work that can happen Mm -hmm. does your is your bodybuilding work a little bit more stable in terms of performance that you're seeing yeah i've noticed for that it's like very consistent like pretty much every time i go in i can either progress reps or load um, pretty much and what is your progression say assuming you deload Mm -hmm. which might be a wrong assumption do you come out of a what's your kind of starting uh kind of a, attempts do you have like an rer you're a, a trying to stick to for that first week and then you're looking to add reps or load week on week after that so that's another thing i've been playing with i actually haven't deloaded since last december um, okay that's a long time <laughs> yeah so um i've been playing around with like managing fatigue a little bit better too uh which is stuff i've seen in the research and just talking with other coaches i know and stuff like that um and kind of on my strength work like keeping the rir a little bit lower um and i've tried this a little bit with clients and it seems to work pretty well with at least the ones that i've been working with to manage fatigue a lot more Uh, but then on my um, accessories i actually push it a lot higher so now i'm actually doing a lot more of them to momentary failure um, and seem to do better with that (laughs) as far as growth goes with um mitigating deloads i would assume therefore Mm -hmm. You're having to use, oh, I don't know how you're managing it. I won't try and guess or assume. What are you doing differently to when previously, I'm guessing you felt like, at least in my experience, I need a deload mm-hmm. because my cumulative fatigue is at a point where my performance is maybe dipping a little bit on some movements and I am just physiologically in that state of high fatigue where it's masking my kind of fitness characteristics. So performance mm-hmm. is dropping in, like motivation to train is dropped, niggles, injuries, stuff like that. So I kind of need to take a step back. How have you got, are you avoiding getting to that point, basically, I'm assuming, where you're kind of uh, almost taking, you're kind of refilling the gas tank before needing to like crash and 
take it, if that makes sense. That maybe makes deload sound a bit bad. It's not necessarily crashing, but yeah. you get my drift. I get what you're saying, yeah. So what I used to do is that every single week on my heavy sets, I would do an AMRAP on the last set. And then now what I'm doing is essentially gauging it, like, well, how does it feel that day? Like, should I really be taking an AMRAP here um, and see how the sets play out? And then so if it's if I just feel like, OK, I got the last set, but like that was, you know, RP is hiking here. It's feeling a lot heavier. OK, I'm not going to take that. Um, if I do take it and I get, you know, if it's, it's a session where I'm doing doubles, if it's a lower body lift, I if I get a triple, I'll do add five pounds like the next week and then try and accumulate and uh, or acclimate to that. But if it's four or more, then I will add 10 pounds. And um, for my bench, I split it down so it's two and a half pounds or five pounds which i have like micro plates i don't have kilo plates but i have plenty of stuff in my garage um, i've got about a thousand pounds of weight and um, all kinds of different goodies now uh, from building my home gym um but so i will do that and then if it's really like bad like i'm training at a time that's not best for me or whatever um i might do um alternative set structures which you know zach has been uh had a lot of research on and i think um what's his name because i say this stuff a lot uh hikma um right um so i in like i read into a lot of that stuff and i'm like looking at it and talk to people taking his courses and and stuff he's done and i'm just like well there's so much that you can do like or with like a low proximity to failure, and especially in Olympic lifting, they find this where they're like taking some of these sets with like a what they're rating as an RP3, and sometimes they're using velocity trackers too, and they're still seeing substantial improvements. So I'm like, well, why would it matter then if I just split this set, you know, into um, like the one that I use the most is um, rest redistrib redistribution where instead of maybe taking doubles, I'll do singles and just double the amount of sets. And I might rest for like three to five minutes. And instead of doing that, I'm going to rest for a minute and a half to like two minutes. Okay, interesting. And I uh, further question to this, and actually maybe this is where I should have started. Is there a reason you've changed from not wanting to use deloads? Because I think people maybe uh, with the, the uh, you made these adjustments before the paper came out with Max Coleman. Mm -hmm. I think people maybe it's people who've taken it um, many different ways, but some people looked at them like, oh, deloads are pointless. And it's like, well, hey, people got the same gains and they did less volume because they took a whole week off. Like, hey, you could look at it either way if you want to. I don't think it can be confirmatory either way. But yeah, what led you to, was it just trying to experiment, not taking deloads or yeah, what was your kind of um, rationale there? Yeah, it was trying to experiment with that because <clears throat> just things where, you know, I'm like reading stuff that Zordos is putting out and Mike Zordos, the DU. Yes. Um, um, I'm very sad that he doesn't rep the Reds anymore and he's going to <laughs> cross, a cross country or marathon running. Yeah. That that took me. I had to make memes and console myself. With that. <laughs> I'm and, sure you um, appreciated that. Um, I did show people that were in his lab and they thought it was very funny. <laughs> um, so anyways uh, back to that um yeah i was just experimenting with it because out of the research that i read uh, which there hasn't been like a ton right in in powerlifting um so i've gone through and read it all and i'm reading it and i'm just like well like they didn't really seem to get a lot of benefit and a lot of the protocols they're using are extremely taxing and fatiguing almost for like no reason to try and just induce like a super compensation effect and i'm like well, what if you just worked to mitigate fatigue more and then acclimate? Like, yeah, you might not get as much um, of that, like super compensation and stuff like that, but could that maybe make your day to day sessions and stuff more like um, consistent? And then you feel like, because I would always experience these where I'd make like tons of progress really, really quickly and then like drop off. Like last year, I was doing like for squats, I was doing. Uh, what's that? 485 pounds for doubles, um, pretty consistently, and then like, you know, life happens, and it dropped way back down to almost like four, four ten, or four. No, it was like 420. Um, and now, um, I've not had a session where I've had to significantly reduce, um, and it's been very stable and consistent. 
Um, even on days where I like might not get less or I might get less sleep or I'm sick or things like that. It just seems like, um, yeah, I'm sacrificing like some speed in that, but it seems to be more stability is there for, for me personally. And does that transfer also to your hypertrophy work as well? How does that um, look? So that has been interesting because I've changed it multiple times. So first I added more sets because I was struggling like with my arms and shoulders thighs. And um, so it was adding more specific sets for those areas. And then uh, started doing that. Okay, I'm seeing some improvements, but let me experiment a little bit more, get a little bit more crazy. So then some of the stuff came out about, you know, um, more training to, to failure, uh, longer muscle length training. Um, so I started experimenting a lot more with that. So I'm taking a lot of that stuff um, more to, you know, like a zero to two RIR and doing more and more stuff in longer muscle length positions. Um, so for like delts, I'll do like behind the back uh, cable uh, lateral raises where it's like right, really getting a stretch. And then um, exclusively for biceps, I do um, behind the back uh, cable curls um, in a full stretch position. And uh, my triceps accessory work is only, I do overhead, um, like I have an easy bar. I'll do overhead extensions with that. It's really interesting to see uh, some people have kind of gone your route in some ways where they've gone like, and they, they've kind of jumped on it and they're like, I'm not saying it's wrong. Uh, yeah. And they've gone into the length and partials and like stretch position. Other people have been quite like conservative, holding themselves back. They're like, hey, I, I can't see it being the way that uh, everything, like there couldn't possibly be sufficient data to suggest we have to, to maximize muscle growth. We just train in the length and position and don't worry about training in the short position. They're like, no, nah, full ROM, I think is still going to be the way to go. It's really interesting seeing people kind of be on, on two sides. There must be like a personality trait of people where they land in this range. So in regards to that, um, did you, so with deloading specifically, did you find you still needed to therefore deload some of your kind of the hypertrophy work, like back off on that? Or because it sounds like you maybe were approaching it a bit differently to your strength work. No, I've actually found that it's gotten better. Like I'm seeing more progress, more consistently. Um, and like, I think because a lot of it is, and like, we're going to get into this later, is that like, I think people really underestimate what they're capable of. So like, when you really try and push it, you realize like, a lot of times in your training, you maybe weren't pushing as hard as you should have. Um, and I've seen this in different things that I reviewed for our newsletter at ATP also, where like, most of that stuff is in um, like endurance training and stuff, but they really have found. And then there's some other stuff where they've done like, um, all of failure training in labs and stuff where people were like hugely underestimating, um, essentially like where they were to failure. I think like Greg Knuckles mentioned one where like, I don't know, a bench, it might've been like a Smith machine bench press where some people had underestimated their proximity to failure by like 16 reps. Um, which is crazy. Yeah. So it's just like, there's, and even pack shared, uh, one where, um, like the self-selected loads and like a lot of people, if they just self-select a load and don't actually train the failure might only be doing like 50% of their one rep max. Yeah. It seems it's a real issue. If when people have to select a load where they think it's their like rep max, they're not very good at it. But when people yeah. are put through a set and they have to like keep going until they think they're at a certain proximity to failure, then they're better at it, which I always just take as like, Hey, don't just hit a certain load and reps take it to where you think you need to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I found that that's allowed me to push much better and on movements that a lot of people like, um, wouldn't expect you like, I don't know. I'm going to say like are more fearful of like loading and stuff like that. Like, I mean, I do like, um, for doubts, um, also I do like a extreme, like cross body with a cable upright row. Um, oh yeah. To get a full line, like stretch and, you know, like historically physios would have been like, oh no, don't do that. It's going to cause you to have like shoulder impingement. And I find actually I have less shoulder issues uh, with bench and different things like that um, as I've been loading it more. So you don't get to a point where I'm trying to get to is for mm -hmm. me, at least uh, I get to a point where, like I said, my performance starts like plateauing because like everything's at zero or I'm hitting failure. And then when I'm at that point, typically the sets later within the session start to take a knock. And I'm just like, man, 
I do not want to train. I feel systemically just kaput. I need to take some days off, whether or not they're deload days or just some days off the gym. And then I can come back and I kind of reset things. So you found you haven't needed that. And that's not because you've done anything particularly special. It's just your body's just recovering and adapting to everything you're throwing at it. Yeah. Yeah. And the way I have things set, like structured too, like, um, you know, like with my kids and everything, like to save time when I'm at home, like I have a setup in my garage, um, which is behind me through this, the window here, um, which I have like a, a cable crossovers. I have um, lever arms. I have uh, like lat pull down row um, safe, safety or spot rack. There we go. Um, you know, lots of weight, different benches. Um, but to save time, sometimes in the morning, I'm doing like, specifically like the dedicated like arm and shoulder work um, then or stuff that I have like lagging areas on and then might some days later that day have a different training session that's more barbell focused or um, on different days so I'm kind of like training pretty much every day of the week um, just maybe sometimes smaller dosages too yeah okay that makes sense and now I'm thinking some of you mentioned that I think is pertinent to this potentially is one, I guess bodybuilding training is a bit new to you and kind of push you, you push yourself harder than you ever have before, which might have bought you a bit of kind of adaptation time, but also that your legs are on the back burner and they don't need much volume, mm-hmm. which when we think about the concept of like MRV, it just opens up a bunch of like, like for me, uh, I need big legs. So I tr- trash myself with legs. So everyone knows leg training is the one that creates the most fatigue for you yeah. so it might be that that's just opened up just this runway so that's something mm-hmm. people can take from this like hey if you're listening you've got big legs or your men's physique and not too worried about it <laughs> yeah. you can uh, like, buy yourself a lot of time practically with clients that's how i like program too is like try and look at like okay where is their strong suit right now and maybe we bring that down to more of like a minimal dosage and then okay we can keep that and they may even still make good progress here but they're really struggling with like either this body part region or lift. Let's push that a little bit more. How, how far can we push that um, to then, you know, bring that up. And that's where then you can even cycle through like different uh, phases too of like, okay, now we're getting where we want to be with this lift or this body part. Okay. Let's bring things back down a little bit again. And then kind of, you know, until things are more evened out where you would like them to be. Yeah, that makes sense out of interest where's your bicep or yeah just say bicep uh, set volume if you roughly know where it is yeah so my biceps i know that's at 20 sets a week but my delt training is anywhere from 20 to almost 30 sets a week and that stays static yeah pretty much Um, it depends on the day like i might have some days where i run out of time so i might miss like okay four sets or something like that usually or one or two here or there it's um my quad volume you said six sets was for is that your quad volume six sets so that's squats but then i do probably 10 sets a week because i'll do like a okay. supine leg extension yeah um when my quad volume isn't wildly higher than yours it's maybe on average getting towards 15 which i don't know i just get trashed from quads <laughs> completely but my um bicep volumes are like four so it's just like these are things that people talk about hey everyone has their like, I don't know, uh, so they, they think there's a certain amount of sets they must do each body part. But it, as you've mm. talked here, it's, it's so individual, even between us two, about what's our priority, how are we recovering yeah. from it? Well, and there's just so much more to it than volume. But something I did want to quote you on was, uh, we likely vastly underestimate what we can actually recover from, which was from a study that you kind of... Uh, mm-hmm we're reviewing overall and it was a more was it a physio based study um i think it'll be no, interesting so for the listeners there was anyway. the one um that was a blood flow restriction training protocol that and that's it, one I of think. the ones where they had found delayed um hypertrophic hypertrophic responses and things like that um after a two-a-day um training set like to failure sets and then there were some others um on downhill running and then there was the one um Muscle damage per se is, um, let me pull it up actually. Cause I, I had to f- go through with like reg and be like, Hey, I know that you posted this study, but I can't find it in your, in your drive on the SBS. Um, but I knew I had uh, posted about it before. And like what they did essentially was, um, had people do once a week, uh, 80 sets of, or 80 repetitions of a maximal um, quad eccentric 
where they were like, I think it was using like a machine to tell like, oh, you're like in, and I was just like looking at the protocol and I was like, I would be trashed from this, yeah. let alone like people that are untrained. And then they took blood markers of them for like the next, I think it was like four weeks of having them do it. And what they found is that over time, eventually those markers of inflammation and muscle damage just kind of like weaned off. They just adapted to it. Yeah. And the same with downhill running. They were like, if you've been exposed to it before, you actually will adapt to this and then um, eventually recover. I know that's something, particularly I know Zach has been talking about, Zach Robinson, mm -hmm. where he's got some thoughts surrounding is like people talk about training to failure being very fatiguing and like an exponential fatigue cost compared to not. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of got thoughts surrounding like, can you adapt to that? Is there a way to adapt to it? Which is interesting. And I think it's just something for people to try out. Mm -hmm. I know similar to you, since that meta aggression came out, particularly for low fatigue, higher rep, isolation-based work, I've much preferred going to two to one RAR because I can just get a better stimulus without having to put on the volume lever so much. And it yeah. hasn't caused me this huge fatigue. But I do know if I tried that for something like my compound quad work, I'd suddenly like... At least this is the way I don't, I don't want to nasiba myself, but I feel like I'd hit a wall pretty quickly uh, mm. and just wouldn't be able to progress as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, and that's what I, because this is like what I preach all the time on my physio page. It's just like adaptability, recovery, resiliency. So I'm like, with myself, I'm just trying to push those boundaries as much as possible and be like, because then if people ask, I can be like, well, hey, like this is what I've done um, as much as anecdote is worth. But like, I find that people, tend to take to that more versus if you like show them a study like hey i've read this in the research and i've tried it and this is what i experienced yeah i really like that uh, i like that just from a coaching perspective like trying it out before giving it to others because i don't know sometimes you can do the hard work for them so and they don't have to risk that but i always think it's like hey you don't know where the cliff edge is sometimes until you like stumble over it a little bit and then you have to pull mm -hmm. back and that's yeah. normally the way i am with like hey oh, maybe overreach a little bit yeah. so you know you've given it your all then back off and, and come back back at it again yeah. but uh, uh yeah i like that like yeah. philosophy and, and that's some of the stuff too i've seen even in like physio physio related research is like they're taking like uh they did these trials in uh australia on like osteoporosis and they specifically took people that have either had an injury or some kind of incident with osteoporosis and put them through like a very heavy resistance training protocol like for individually for them they were doing like 80 to 85 percent of one rep max on uh, squat squat bench overhead press and then they were doing pull-ups and then they at the top they would just drop and, and land wow um, and you know they're like 65 plus people and then there was another one where i found in a nursing home they were having them do deadlifts at 90 percent of their one rep max Jeez. Um, <laughs> And just all these populations that are supposed to be like frail and it's still promoting like, hey, you should still probably be doing high intensity. And even in stroke rehab, that's what they're recommending, like high intensity stuff um, because we're like, hey, the body's robust and resilient. And when you present it with these challenges, that's when you actually see these adaptations. And we actually probably need that to see things like bone and cartilage and ligaments and things like that actually have some kind of adaptation. And even yeah. like, like, look at sports, like, you know, everybody makes a big deal about people lifting with a barbell in certain positions or out of a certain position. But then you're like, but like, I can show you this picture where like, if you look at an average NBA game where somebody's running at like 20 miles an hour and their knee goes into like valgus, like, you know, remember physics is force equals mass times acceleration. So there may be less mass, but their acceleration is a lot higher. And it even gets into some of the tendon research, like why um, lifting seems to be less of an issue for people when they have tendon issues. Yeah, this is, I think this is a chat we're going to come to, but I just wanted to yeah. quote because it fits really well here. Yeah. You said, think wear and repair, not wear and tear. And I really like that mm -hmm. kind of thought process where it's like, hey, you can like acclimate to these things. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. just touching on the, the volume thing. I, actually, mm -hmm. first, did you bring up the study just in case you brought it up and we can... Oh, yeah, it was... Um... Let me see, because I sent it to, because I have so many people I still talk to. I sent it to Kedrick, um, over at, you know, over New Zealand. Um, 
because I know he helps with the um, spreadsheet that they have on uh, Stronger by Science. So it's eccentric, eccentric exercise per se does not affect muscle damage biomarkers early and late phase adaptations. And that's from 2021. And what was the kind of the ext how extreme did they get to just so like people can understand like what they're able to essentially mm -hmm. deal with? Yeah. So they did 10 weeks of um, an isokinetic resistance exercise with like their um, quad muscles. And they did per week, they did 75 maximal knee extensor actions. Um, and then they would took, um, they, then they assessed like their soreness, the late onset muscle soreness, range of motion, different things like that. And then they also took um, markers of their creatine kinase, which would be like a marker of muscle damage, as well as C-reactive protein, which is a marker for inflammation, um, which is, we'll we get into that when we get in there. But like those two, like at systemically like low levels is actually part of the reason why probably people are having issues like in the general population with like more where they think like wear and tear. And it's because of these low level mark things that are there all the time uh, related to like uh, systemic health, like obesity, blood pressure, diabetes, like all that stuff. Um, but what they did was they measured these um, before, uh, before they would do these things and then two days after each session. And then what they started to find is, is I think it was like about a month out, is that these markers for like inflammation and the creatine kinase levels just started kind of steadily going down, uh, which meant that their body was becoming accustomed to that and no longer experiencing muscle damage. Even though technically you would think that their strength and stuff would probably be getting, going up. So their weight and things like and volume probably were going up. Yeah, it's interesting because that's something I think is spoken about as you get more advanced you tend to experience less muscle soreness at least mm -hmm. that seems to be something i hear very often people say like i've heard example like people who have been training 10 years and they're like i never get sore and then you have someone like a mike israel who will say hey if your muscles never getting sore man maybe you can be doing more and growing better potentially uh, i don't know where you stand with that for me like i have i always use my biceps as an example because they're like my genetic strong point and like they never get sore they grow really easily i don't know if they're a muscle i can really talk about and then other muscles they're like a bit hit or miss but once i'm like in the thick of training i don't really get like soreness i get fatigue for sure but they don't like get that tender i don't know if how you are with that i'll say for me specifically like i tend to notice like i wouldn't say i get like true muscle soreness but i'll have some times where i'll like notice like oh hey i can feel that i definitely like worked this but it's because also during the sessions, I'm like seeking, like, I want a really good stretch or like a pump or whatever. Um, so I'm really trying to push the boundaries on certain things like all the time to see how far I can take it. Yeah, so um, that makes sense. It kind of aligns with what I've heard and also what I've had, uh, experienced. And we're talking off air and we're not going to dive into this study now, but there was a recent study that I think Dr. Pack and Milo Wolf really kind of put out there into like social media and people like lost their minds about kind of doing ramping of set volume. And I, I can't remember the specific different set numbers there were, but they went up to 52 sets for quads. Mm -hmm. And there was, I mean, it was two RER or less. So very high intensity, assuming they were doing that, which um, like people can debate like two minute rest periods between sets, which is just madness. So they must have had to have reduced the load so heavily. They weren't super strong individuals. I think they had a one rep max of just over 100 kilos or something on the squat. So it's not like they're super strong, but clearly trained. I don't know yeah. if you had any thoughts on seeing that just generally. Um, I did comment on that because I wasn't that surprised given like, you know, just where like mindset some people can be and like even the limitations you can put on yourself. Like I could understand like, yeah, if you're really, really strong and you're, you're like just able to sling like tons of volume on certain things, but like at the same time, you'll still probably acclimate to it as long as you're programming and like you're at least sleeping and like all these other things. Because in um, research, when I'm doing uh, coursework, like I've made some courses for rehab professionals on like programming and stuff like that. In the intro one, I talk about some research that I looked at in sarcopenia and like osteoporosis and stuff and like in 
other populations where they might be hospitalized. And they, they're in the, some of these studies doing like 40 sets a week for, for certain things. So I'm like, these are supposed to be people that you're considering like frail, same with like cancer diagnoses and stuff, but like they're doing huge volumes with them. Um, so it's like, we can probably push things a lot further than we might think. Yeah, and I guess, <clears throat> I guess it, for me, it's not so surprising that they could do it. It's mm -hmm. whether or not, and the question I have here as well is something that's been spoken about before is like, hey, yeah. are we benefiting at a certain point or are we just being yeah. able to recover from doing more? Like, can you, you can always add a set, right? <laughs> yeah. Whether or not it's beneficial is another question. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, and that's what I've tried to balance too with different things. Cause I think it, it probably also is going to depend on like, that's why I actually another reason why I split some of my days out because I wanted to see like, okay, can I push higher volume, especially if they're done like different days? Like if I spread this out and then that say maximizes muscle protein synthesis, maybe that helps with recovery cost. Um, you know, because in train people like your muscle protein synthesis might, it, it, I've seen varying numbers from it could be as low as like three hours to 24 hours kick it, kicking it up again when you introduce a stimulus. And even with like anabolic resistance, like for me in rehab, when I give a patient something, if they're older and have like diabetes and different things like that, it might be actually better for me to give them a couple sets like every day because they're going to be anabolically resistant. And they seem that volume overcomes that a little bit. And then um, so by spreading it out, are you maximizing that stuff? Uh, improving your recovery potentially because instead of doing like you know 20 sets in one day you're doing them spread out over an entire week and that might be more recoverable do you not see the progress you would like are you sick of writing your own programs or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We create the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. Yeah, for sure. No, I know. Um... Yeah, because they actually, I guess, 52 sets. I don't know how many. They were doing a lot of sets. I think they were split between like yeah. three sessions or something. I can't actually remember. Okay. Do you remember? Um, but I think they were doing a lot of sets in a single session. Yeah. And it, it kind of did put to question like junk volume because, I mean, yeah. I can, like I said, I can continue to do ad, uh, ad sets. But it was a, just as an example, I was doing leg press a couple of days ago. No, like yesterday. And I did two sets, which is like, after two sets, my quads are just like, they feel like they're completely kaput. Mm. I'm like, I can go into the leg extension. I can crank some things out on there. But another set of leg press, man, I reduced the load 10% and I got like pitiful reps on it. And I was like, yeah, I was done. Like I hit failure. And it was like, you, do you know when you hit a failure where you're like, I, I don't feel like I should have failed there, but I just can't do it. It was kind of that sort of sensation. Okay. Something, something hard to describe. But I was just like, yeah, I mean, I could do another set here even, but I'm just going to have to reduce the load even more to be able to get any mm. sort of reps out. It doesn't feel like it's productive. I don't know if that makes sense. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> well, because you, you it, like with, with bodybuilding too, because like powerlifting, you're balancing that fitness fatigue and bodybuilding, you're always kind of managing, especially with novel movements or like new stuff. You're potentially balancing also like muscle dam like damage with protein synthesis spiking too. So it's like, at, at what point, and I've seen varying numbers, like Menno Henselman has like a blog about this where it's like looking at, and I know James Krieger had done like a uh, unofficial like study to like look at maybe where's like the productive line. Um, and it can vary like in the session or in that day, anywhere I, I read from six to, it was like 15 sets in yeah. that single session where if, you get past that you may actually be inducing more uh muscle protein degradation rather than a stimulus to be adding more tissue 
which I mean, kind of makes sense a little bit biologically, like your body doesn't really want to try and add muscle if it can help it. Yeah, it, that's where I'd seen these kind of numbers of anything above like a 10 to 12 number of sets in a single session. It's probably starting mm. to get into that junk volume territory. Yeah. It's just like this set kind of blew that into question. And I don't know exactly why. Um, it's obviously just one study and you, you can't kind of, it, you have to take it in with every other study that's already there. But it still did point to, hey, more volume seemed to lead to better results, which is at least that's like a, another tick in that sort of direction where if someone's thinking, hey, should I be doing more or less? I, I guess you'd be here with this, Jacob, is like you probably side with more. Assuming though, and I think you'd also say this, like your intensity is there because mm -hmm. that's kind of, uh, that's the horse that leads the cart in a sense versus the other yeah. way. Yeah, and with like a lot of people just for because of my background, I heavily like prioritize, like, how are you sleeping? What's your stress like? What are you actually eating enough for what you're trying to achieve? Um, or are we like in a cutting phase and we shouldn't be doing this? Um, are they actually getting enough protein or, or whatever, you know, like, um, cause I found that that can be also a big, big contributing thing. Like, um, and I've seen that with, with patients a lot too, where like they have, the population I see, like just being able to cook certain things or knowing how to do that is, is a challenge. So, um, you know, I've figured out ways to try and minimize it so they can, and in affordability too, because where I live and who I work with. I can't remember the saying that I come back to, I need to like, uh, make sure I get this quoted on me with something like bodybuilding is trying, trying to train or like the goal for bodybuilders is train as hard as like as hard as you can as often as can as much as you can <laughs> like whatever allows you to do that yeah. and that's going to look so different for everyone but lifestyle is is hugely hugely underrated with all of that like hey yeah. if people are seeing this and they're like man i can barely recover from like five sets of quads a week it's like uh, i mean either you're super strong and really training very hard or mm -hmm. you don't sleep well you don't care take care of your nutrition have to be doing those things although i do wonder i don't know what these individuals were doing but that's uh yeah that's another once, podcast i have to run and once it becomes a lifestyle it's like easier for us to take for granted because just like i i honestly haven't tracked since my daughter was born and she's four now like i haven't tracked macros but i can still like adjust things just by looking at things and stuff and pretty much i get probably i get i'm about 93 kilos um give or take probably more i'm like more like 210 right now in pounds so um i get anywhere between like 140 grams of protein to at least um 200 so and that's like a, a given on every day so you know yeah it's i definitely take it for granted where it's like clockwork for me uh, i even had it i was peaking one of my bodybuilders this week and i was like I need to remember that he doesn't live at home, like work from home like I do. He can't just go and adjust his carbohydrates immediately. Like he has to <laughs> like go to the store and whatever, because that's something we were managing. I was like, you sometimes always have to put yourselves in your client's shoes. Uh, I think that's a, a really good trait to have. With your bodybuilding to kind of talk about that, to <clears throat> kind of finalize that topic, you said you're not looking to compete. Is that a confirmed, like you, you don't see that in your future or have you got any thoughts? So I could. Um... But just not for a while, just because with the, my kids and everything and like everything they're going to have going on, it's just not a good, it would not have been like a good a place to like do uh, this year, at least like maybe, maybe two, three years. I know I've talked about like uh, potentially in 2026 would probably be the best time if I were going to do it. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so the, yeah, the next topic was talking about that wear and repair, not wear and tear. Mm -hmm. And you were kind of refer referencing deep squatting and how our machines, uh, sorry, our machines, our bodies aren't machines. So we don't yeah. just wear out. And I think a lot uh, of people think about that. So I'd love to expand on that a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, some of those things you'll see is like, um, it's one of those things like with, you'll see it with bodybuilding and, and powerlifting training too, is like the critique about having like short term studies and stuff like that. So, and a lot of foundational research on like where some of that stuff has come from or where like physicians and stuff pull from i mean a lot of it is also like our um, mindset which we don't have enough time to get into all that stuff um uh, but i'm doing like a fellowship on some of that and we're talking about it and like looking at our worldviews um 
doing that through what's called the human relational framework, um, which is a group um, uh, dynamic principles. Um, on, they're on Instagram and they have their own website. Um, but we're talking about that stuff because like, what you'll see is these short-term studies essentially will look at like, well, what is maybe induce like say muscle damage or does it induce like a loss of like water content and cartilage or uh, discs or whatever, right? And so what they'll look at is in short term based on, oh, you did, I, I mean, I read one of them when it was like a deadlift study that had people deadlift and the water content and their discs reduced. So they said over time, oh, well, the deadlift causes your discs to wear out. But what they don't consider is that that is normal part of a response to like training load. Like that is normal. And that is actually usually what triggers adaptation is usually you see short term, there's increases in inflammation, uh, damage, or like reduced water content and these things. And then that sparks your body to say, hey, I need to do something here and, and add tissue or become more robust or resilient. And then like long term, a lot of times what you see is that it's what happens. Cause like too, with even in arthritis, you would think like, well, if it's wearing out, then why do I have more bone there? And, you know, also people with neoarthritis have um, a lot more arthritis in their hands, but how often you hear people, oh, I got my fingers replaced, like, or whatever. Like you do see weird stuff with some people's hands, but it's just not as common as like knee pain. Yeah, I think that's similar to like, hey, look at this study. It caused muscle damage, not muscle growth. It like makes you think yeah. of that. It's like that's the response, and then you repair the muscle damage and you see the growth on the other side. Like if we ne like with this, I guess if they kept doing it and they never let it, the body adapt to it, it comes back to that adaptation. Like it's a very normal yeah. thing. Uh, that makes sense. And actually, something I've seen spoken about, I think it comes from physio, right? In terms of active and passive range of motion. I think that's initially where it came from was like physio. But you'll see quite a few, I guess, people in the bodybuilding scene, like bio biomechanists talking about like, hey, we should only work within active range that we can control and not come into passive tissues. Does this relate to that in your head? Like uh, are people worrying about the wrong thing or unnecessarily? I, I, I probably are because like even in those instances, you'll see like, uh, I mean, like in Olympic weightlifters and stuff like um, they'll, you'll see a lot. Like uh, my friend um, Diego, who's skeptical physio, did a post about this around the same time as I was doing a bunch of mine. And um, he had a video of an uh, Olympic weightlifter in the like the Olympics or a high level competition. And they like their knee goes way into like valgus and, and in physio, they'd be like, oh, that's going to tear your like ACL or, or whatever. Um, but he like corrects and then he gets the lift. Like, and my thing is a lot of times we see that and then are like, oh my God, that was awesome, whatever. But then like if somebody, uh, an average person were to post that on their like Instagram, you can bet like they'd end up on one of these like gym fails page or, or whatever. Um, because people are like, oh my God, you're going to hurt your knee or this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, I guess that actually brings me to a point I had where you spoke about how certain positions might lead to more injuries, uh, but often it's lack of prior exposure. And it's like a, mm -hmm. if you get into that position suddenly. So I guess if I'm thinking about this, it's like, hey, if you're looking to get deeper on your leg press, then don't like suddenly go from like barely getting inches down to like full crazy rom with your knees by your ears kind of graduate yeah. there is that how you'd advise it yeah because the tissue needs i mean the thing is with like your muscles they have such rich blood supply and uh, nutrition being pushed to them all the time that you know they're gonna recover much faster like on average you know like muscle protein synthesis and trained people like we said like varies and that's because your body might not need that much more to help recover um like the tissue per se uh but tendons and like the i mean bone is full of like rich supply but it does take longer to kind of like put down the calcium and stuff um and cartilage has no like almost no blood supply depending on where you look um and it needs movement to get some of that in and out so it needs a little bit longer time to recover um, and adapt so it's not to say you can't like actually progress it very well um, quickly, but you need to kind of respect it a little bit to be like, okay, I'm not going to just go like, if I'm doing 500 pounds on a leg press and I'm doing like half range of motion, I'm not always get sudden going to do full range of motion tomorrow and expect that I'm going to feel great. 
yeah, that makes sense. I guess it's when you see these extreme videos online where people are getting injured going to these positions, normally it is when they're trying to like max out doing a PR mm -hmm. that they've never attempted before and they clearly don't have control or ownership over that load. And I guess yeah. is uh, in addition to what you said there in terms of like, hey, take your time, is there anything else you would suggest to people to help prevent injury? I mean, part of it is exposing to some of these positions, right? And not being afraid to have variability because even like people who are foundational to motor, like learning and movement, uh, like Nikolai uh, Bernstein, I think is his name. Um, I mean, his prime example was like, he um, like showed a blacksmith, like swinging a hammer. And he's like, no two swings are the same when we track this and look at it. And he goes, and this is a person who does this all day, every day for their living. So like, you can expect that like, Part of variability is a good thing because when you put too many constraints on it and don't vary, um, that actually creates like more uh, issues. It seems like in our nervous system, our nervous system also doesn't like that. That's why kids do well with like um, enriched environments, like exposure to lots of different things all the time and different simulations, different movements. Um, and our body responds well to that too. So if you're consistently not getting in certain positions, say your bodybuilder, or power lifter, and then you go, well, now I'm going to go play that pickup football game or rugby or basketball. And I mean, football, like, is in the sense of uh, every, everywhere else in the world, not in America. <laughs> um, because not getting in those positions is part of the reason why. Because, like, you're in the speed, right? So, like, lifting itself is not very high velocity. Um, and that may be some of the reason why you think, like, tendon, people with tendon issues they have less pain and issues when they're lifting heavy loads because it's the velocity is so much lower. But then when you go to jump or run or things like that, it's a lot more force. So it, it requires like a little bit different, um, different kind of like quality to be accustomed to. So, and if you're not exposed to those things and your tissues aren't exposed to those things, they won't have had a chance to adapt to that and get better at doing those things. You haven't asked it to do that. Um, and even you'll see in the Olympic weightlifting, they will train sometimes into and in, uh, how to get out of valgus position so they can kind of like correct their lift. If they do get out of position, how do I correct for that and still successfully make the lift and not get hurt? So, um, and you'll see some of that. I've seen some physios that'll do that in sport rehab too, is they'll purposely have people be like, okay, get into this position or we're going to do this movement. And it's going to force you to like sometimes go into valgus or do this or that or other thing that makes sense and uh yeah on a, on a related note actually because you spoke about uh, length and partials and that is something that i've also seen as a potential criticism of using them is that it could be more injurious because you're getting mm -hmm. into ranges i don't know that you haven't before because you're trying to maximize that range of motion did you notice anything as you were using length and partials and is there anything you did specifically to try and mitigate that or do you think that's not such a concern that people should have I would say unless it's like a position that you're really not used to loading that maybe you just like over time, like, you know, you could even just give it every like few days or like once a week, like say if I started with a bicep curl and it was like down like this, and then I wanted to get back into full shoulder extension um, where my shoulders like straight up or whatever is most comfortable for you to be able to get into that position, like just, you know, on the, the cable column or whatever if you're using that just go up one notch like every week or so um you know because your body will let you know like um sometimes pain it's fickle but like sometimes pain is like a good way to be like hey like we're not accustomed to this like maybe we shouldn't do this um you know like be more wary and and tells you to back off because ideally like it doesn't always work this way but if pain worked as we all think it should, it should be there as an alarm and should tell you actually before you hurt yourself. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned pain is fickle because I was uh, referring to the leg press again. The amount of times I've done leg press and I'm warming up, I'm like, man, I'm getting a bit of pain in my knee. And then I'll continue and I'm just like, oh, now I'm not getting pain in my knee. And then it will come back yeah. and I'm like, why does this like sometimes hurt, sometimes doesn't hurt? I'll do a set and then I just will forget the pain ever existed. Uh, so yeah, pain is a, it's a very complex topic that we're not going to jump into now because I know that would take like probably multiple podcasts yeah. worth. <laughs> Maybe once I'm done with the fellowship that I'm doing, uh, we can, or I'll do something because um, I'll 
be much more comfortable in the complex things that we're going over right now in there. For sure. We have um, one more myth, I think, to bust was, uh, mm-hmm. and something that I think is just a pervasive myth. I think if you ask any person on the street, they'd probably believe this. Probably lots of people in the fitness industry still seem to think this is uh, relating to uh, lifting weights and stunting growth in children. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear you kind of, yeah, basically myth bust. Yeah, because so um, shout out to Derek, who's in Barbell Medicine, um, because he does a lot of work on this too. He's had a whole like series and and podcasts and stuff. And then there's the researcher, Alan Flanagan, um, or Feigenbaum, sorry, Alan Feigenbaum. Um, he does a lot of research on this. And then what actually sparked me to like look a little bit more into it was um, reading John Keeley's, Kylie's paper on the periodization um, inconvenient truth, where he actually had the report of like kind of because what I like to do is with these myths, like look into like where did it come from? Like how far back can I track this? Um, because a lot of the myths, you'll track them all the way back and you'll be like, what the heck like how is this per- <laughs> yeah. like persisted like the uh, knees over toes comes from one singular biomechanics study that was done at like duke in the 70s that was ran with that they found that there was more force on your patellar tendon and like uh, a kill or um, acl when your knee tracked that way and the same with like deep squatting was um and there's a whole iron culture episode about that that so we won't get into that one and but with kids it was that they found that in post world war ii japan which was not doing very well because of obvious reasons for a little while um that malnourished children who were doing manual labor for upwards of like 80 to maybe 100 hours a week um had stunted growth which is if you know anything like i'm into archaeology stuff and history and stuff they and one of my professors was a forensic anthropologist um, like bones if you've ever seen that tv show so and what they find is that this is the case too with any like cultures like where any cultures had like slavery or things like that the children are being forced to work manual labor jobs even all all of them are um, with poor nutrition and so they tend to have stunted growth and they show like all these problematic health conditions but what they they took away from this was that because they were doing the heavy manual labor that was what was bad for them that correlated to they shouldn't lift weights so kids shouldn't lift weights yeah that's a wild like correlation causation (laughs) thing to jump upon and also seems like the less obvious one like the malnourishment feels quite obvious yeah so that spiraled and it's just like now it's course correcting because actually now like um and i had my kids like do stuff too um like my daughter i mean the pictures i had in the post that i sent you the first slide that's my daughter my son will come out and watch me um and i have her lift weights she does her own has to do her own pt for developmental um things that she's had and you know she can farmer carry 10 pounds across the room and back um and she maybe weighs like 40 pounds (laughs) so she's carrying half her body weight um But the American Pediatric Association for like um, their position stance is that kids can lift weights as young as like four years old. Um, And especially because like if they're acclimated and accustomed to it, like it actually seems to be beneficial, like long term for like bone health, uh, for it helps with like cognitive development, memory, um, kids who participate in sports and other things like do better in school and stuff like that for various reasons. But uh, we just know that it has all these like health benefits and cognitive benefits and everything like it doesn't seem to stunt your growth. So unless we're going to send like kids to the mines or things like that, which I filtered through that with um, in that post, too, is like, you know, those are the times where you've seen like in Victorian era and things like that, where kids are like being forced to partake in child labor. Like that's when this is an issue. But like if they want to lift weights because they want to lift weights because mom and dad or or whoever is doing it and they see you and they're like, hey, can I do that too? Like it's perfectly safe for them. Like, um, you know, if you fracture a growth plate, yeah, that's going to be a problem. But nobody talks about like, oh, my kid was playing on the playground and they fell off the swing and broke their arm. 
and but we don't tell kids not to play on the playground or swing on the swings yeah i think this is that's the only thing i could remember that some people had talked about was the growth plates and it's exactly <laughs> like you said there it's essentially like if you fracture one that seemed to be the only concern but i mean yeah it's how i've never fractured anything in the gym and i've been doing it for like a decade over a decade yeah. like how, as long as you're teaching your children how to lift safely and effectively i'm guessing that's like yeah. i mean even if you look at the literature of like injuries created through like bodybuilding it's like incredibly mm -hmm. low versus like just general sports yeah even like strongman which would be the one where you're getting in more like awkward and uncomfortable positions that the injury rate for that is still lower than like soccer uh, football uh, american football um you know even running like running like um which everybody tells you like to do like recreational running has like a very high injury rate comparatively like i'm not and that's the thing is like i am not a person who enjoys like running uh but i still will have patients like that come in if they like to run or they ask me about running i still say like Oh yeah, that's great for you. You should be doing that. That's like perfectly fine. Um, you know, I'm not out here like making posts like, oh, you should never go and run because it's awful for you and you're going to get hurt. Um, and that's the problem I have with like even some of the big accounts is like they're purporting to be like this, and even sometimes in their uh handle, like person who is supportive of barbell lifting or like hypertrophy or strength training or whatever but then they have all these very negative things to say rather than um being productive in that way there's always like this underlying thing that i have issues with that i've talked about in the past and everything yeah i think a huge message that i take from you jacob is like hey like you're very um pro like experimentation getting into things not being scared like trust your body in some ways don't be reckless don't be silly like graduate yeah. into things but don't be like afraid like if you set if like you almost set yourself a failure if you're afraid like experiment yeah. try things if they don't feel like generally if they don't feel bad it's probably not something to be like completely scared of um and if you can control and manage it in a, a safe and productive way it seems like yeah. but i mean that's like i mean i don't know about you but like for <clears throat> most of us like that's why we like lifting too is like there's a look like the reason one of the things I liked about being is, is like as strong as I am, like in our community, like I'm not the strongest, but like for an average person, like if I tell an average person that I can put 500 pounds on my back and squat down all the way and stand back up, they just like their mind like explodes because, and I think about that too, when I lift sometimes now I'm like, geez, like, like if my wife tried to do this or like yeah. some of my family members, like this could literally kill them. Like, um, but like that's something that I can do so it's like cool it's and it's like yeah it's dangerous but that's like part of the exciting thing about it like that's why people like like motorsports and um, you know all these different things and that's why kids like to play like they like to jump and go on the side because it's exhilarating like that's why we like amusement parks and things like that you like that controlled like you know danger yeah yeah it's a calculated not like yeah, hey, I'm not, I wouldn't say as a bodybuilder, I'm like a thrill seeker, but certainly yeah. like getting under a heavy hack squat, heavy, heavy leg press, like there's, it's in, in the moment, it's like torture in some ways, like mm -hmm. it like kind of is, but after like the sense of accomplishment you get from it, it's like nothing else, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, um, I mean, it goes back to like the Socrates or it might be, might be him. Yeah. It was like, you know, no man has the right to be an amateur um in all it's pretty much saying like in all things like whether it's mental and physical and so like i push myself mentally so i'm like well let me push my body to the furthest extent that i can too and, and i even use lessons like that with my kids like you know there's the one line in game of thrones um in the first this isn't the first book it's in the, the show a little bit but i didn't, didn't feel like it had the same weight um so bran is asking his dad he's like talking about being a knight and a warrior and like all these things that are valued in their culture and he goes, but I'm, I'm afraid. And his dad's like, I'm afraid pretty much telling him like, I'm afraid too. Like the only, cause he's like, can I be brave if I'm afraid? And he goes, the only time a man can truly be brave is when you are afraid. So like my daughter, like if she says she's scared of something, I go, that's okay. But as long as you keep going, like that shows that you're brave, like you can do this. And so like, I walk her through those things like mentally. And if you're like that as a parent, you're teaching your kids like with control, like, okay, you can do this as a safe, like 
and to see so many things with my kids that are like they'll do and try now that like I see other kids are like oh I don't want to do that I'm afraid like you know um and same with pain like I've conditioned her so well that like if she gets hurt or stuff she doesn't really like freak out and I've taught her like oh no you're gonna heal like she got a scrape on her nose a few weeks ago and she's like she's like oh I got a scab it means I'm healing I'm a good healer right yeah <laughs> I like that a lot. And yeah, those sort of quotes, you probably know a bunch from anime as well, where yeah. just like drive yourself to be better. Like, yeah. Sort of and that's why I believe mean, that's in yourself. Part of the reason why I like Berserk so much is like, it's, it's so dark and so twisted, but like he just persists, overcomes and, and understands like, you know, I'm, and that's a big thing that I am personally like, you know, I suffered through this. So I want to do things so other people don't have to. Um, and and that's like what I want to do with, with like my education and everything, like help people like, okay, I went through all this hard work and did all these things or like figure these things out. So like, you know, le learn from me because I learned so much from other people and have helped like you shouldn't have to struggle through things like I did or whoever did in the past. Yeah, for sure. Like learn from my mistakes so you don't have to make them too uh yeah. I, can put, I completely see eye to eye on you with that jacob so yeah well i have covered all the topics i wanted to cover today so thank you so much for your time yeah. jacob and uh i'm sure we'll have more myths to bust or talk more about your bodybuilding and when you're going to be putting on the uh the shiny trunks and the, the orange tan uh if i gotta learn to pose better first <laughs> true yes there is uh, like we're talking off air the posing is key and also big art to it it just takes time. That's what it is, practice. And it's not, and it depends. Some people like posing. I'm not the biggest fan. It's all right. But if you like it, it's great. If you don't like it, it's a bit of a chore. So you just have to kind of get used to that. But anyway, yeah. um, if you, people want to keep up with your work, um, maybe see some of these posts that you, we spoke about, where mm -hmm. should they head? So the best place that I am at is uh, Instagram at strength and evidence underscore physio, which you can see on there, like I offer coaching, um, mentoring, coursework. Um, I have an education platform called Pragmatic Rehab Principles that's also on Instagram. We have a course that actually we're going to be hosting in Miami in January. Um, so there'll be more information about that. And I have um, moved in, like I'm still coaching for ATP, but I've um, had a partnership with a company called Curve House. So I'm actually starting to make like rehab related templates and offer coaching on their platform too, um, which you can find on my uh, socials as well. Fantastic. I'll make sure that's all linked in the description. Thank you guys for listening and we'll catch you soon. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it and we will help you achieve this. The mini cup movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cup so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cup movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.